come out and knocked at the door again, and there was my older sister. And my younger sister, first thing my older sister asked me, she said, tell me, did you see father somewhere? Said, Maybe you know where father is, my father. I said, don't hope, don't put up too much hope. I don't think he'll make it. He didn't, people didn't make it in my thousand. So happened he didn't make it, and there's people that were waiting for him to die. As a matter of fact, there was a neighbor of ours here in New Rochelle, Weinberg, who was, a, who was a, an attendant to my father in the camp, in the camp uh, hospital or whatever it was over. My father was laying in a straw hospital. And the, the, the car, the, the, uh, he was a 16 or 18 years old boy. He was one of the caretakers in the, in the uh, camp, hospital, called hospital. And my father died there in the hospital. He came home. And he told me uh, because he comes to my town also, Weinberg. And uh, he told our sisters what happened, and uh, right away he went back to Pasch because he got a good kosher meal. That's the first time I ate kosher a year and a half. In uh, Budapest, to go home to Devitz and to Nierenhazel, they gave us a ration with uh, a meat. Pork, pork and beans, they all got to this. That was the last time I ate <laughs> pork and beans from the, uh, from the United Jewish Appeal Kitchen in Budapest. Can you describe the moment you arrived in America? Uh, <clears throat> As I said, I learned in Yeshiva, I went back to Yeshiva. My sister said they couldn't do anything with me. My older sister got married, and my younger sister was married when I was already in Shiva in Czechoslovakia. I went back to Czechoslovakia for the wedding. I went back to, and I, meanwhile, I also applied to go come to America. I applied for a Hungarian passport, first of all. I got a Hungarian passport, very interesting way. They kept on promising me the, the, the passport control was under the police, the Minister of Interior. So the, the bottom line was we had to get the passport from the police. I had a police captain in Yilichhausa who was very friendly to us, and he helped us out to get me a passport. But at the end, I couldn't get it. So I went up to Budapest. I stayed by Paskas. Paskas moved up to Budapest, meanwhile. And I went up to the police prefecture and I asked the, uh, the guard there, I want to see the commandant of the police here at the police headquarters. So he says, how old are you? I said, I'm 16. You want to see the commandant of the uh, police? He says, give me anybody. I want to talk to the police. I was 16 years old. I was not a big boy. So he comes out, an officer come back, comes out. Yes, I tell him, look, my name is this and this. I was, oh, I was, I was promised a passport two months ago, and I still don't have it. I'm not going to leave here until I get my passport. I'll get a passport. So he looks at me. He was a, he was a police colonel. He says, you got some nerve to come in here and tell me that to give me an ultimatum. So I told him, I have no choice. I have to leave. I have nobody here anymore. I have to leave this country. It so happened, I heard before. He was a Jew, that colonel. He knew what I meant. He went back, he went back to the office. He stayed outside, waiting for me. I came, he came out with a half an hour with a Finnish passport for me. I got a passport. So now I had to have a visa to America. I went to Budapest again to go to the Consul General in Budapest to get a student visa to study. I had an invitation from to Yeshiva Torvedas to come and study the rabbinics. So every two weeks, he found the police prefecture, the uh, council found some other problems. He needed this paper, that paper. I saw finally, I won't make it. He never gave me a visa. So what happened was in Prague, there was a very friendly council. Anybody went up for a visa, got a visa. 
Ah, mas família, vida, até a vida, coisa boa, só a gente, já que eu sou aqui, em Yeshiva, só a gente, já que eu sou aqui, coisa boa, isso é tudo isso, é tudo bem, smuggled through, with a smuggled van, because I didn't have an open passport or a visa to Czechoslovakia. So I joined a bunch of smugglers overnight. We came to, uh, to uh, Prague. We came to Novomester, the war frontier town. Right away they asked me for papers. I showed them the papers. I had a 30-day stay in Czechoslovakia. Every time, I, as long as I was there, they extended the 30 days. My 30 days was up that morning when I came back from Kosice. I went straight to Prague and I... But meanwhile, while I was at the frontier town to meet my sister, to bring me my, my winter coat, I was going to America. We met at the border of Hungary and Czechoslovakia. So what happened was, the, uh, my sister came and met me at the border town of, 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 uh, of Uhel. And I got the winter coat, and I went back to Prague that night. I had to go to the police prefecture to get my visa extended 30 days. So the Hungarian section of the police prefecture was a Hungarian guard, a big anti-Semit. So I don't know how they made him a section chief after the war. So he gave me every, every, every time he gave me a 30-day stamp. So I went up, this was the last day of my 30-day stamp, and I went into his office and showed him my passport. But in Kosice, when I got it, got to the frontier town, somebody was familiar, I was in the yeshiva there, with the police head in Kosice. So when I was there, even though I didn't have no visa, he gave me a stamp, I can stay there for seven days. That covered me till, till Monday, Prague, at the train, Sunday night. So uh, he looks at my passport, he says, you went to Kosice to the frontier town. I said, I had to get my winter coat to my, my sister, my sister, I have to go to America. He says, I told you not to go, you're black market, you went to black market. I said, I'm not a black market here, I don't work. I'm 16 years old, what do you want from me? You met, you met, you went to where I told you not to go. He takes my passport, he knocks it to the floor, to the gate, to the door, says, get out of here. I was in the corridor of the police prefecture in Prague. I had nobody there. I'm, my passport was, was gone because it was overdated already. And uh, I was standing there at, the, at his door and waiting for somebody to come. Finally, there was somebody showed up. A man comes in with a mustache. He says, what's the matter, young boy? I says, I, get a, I was supposed to get a 30-day visa to stay here. And he threw me out of the office, doesn't give me a visa, because I went to Kosice to say goodbye to my sister. He says, give me your passport. He happened to be the head of the Gouda in Prague. I didn't know, I didn't know. So he takes my passport and goes, he says, wait here. He goes downstairs, he comes up with a carton of American cigarettes, he goes into the, to the police uh, prefecture's office, he gives them the carton of cigarettes, he says, I need a carton of cigarettes. I need a, I need a, uh, I need a, a visa for another 30 days. So he cropped a visa in my passport. He also said, Oskar, he plugged in, exit, no more extensions. And he got the carton of cigarettes from the good guy. And uh, it was a miracle. I didn't know what to do. I had no legal papers to stay there. And I had no, nothing in the world. I didn't know anybody. I stayed in the Jewish appeal, another Jewish appeal restaurant in Prague where I was in Prague. So this was, uh, this was uh, the exit, the visa to America. My sister came to the frontier town. We had a bridge separated Czechoslovakia and Hungary. If you went to the bridge, the other side of the bridge, you were in communist country. You were on this side, you were in Czechoslovak country. So the guard, the, the, the frontier guards kept on saying, come on, come over to our side. We can accommodate you. I said, no, no, my sister's coming. She's going to come on this side and give me my coat. I got my coat, I went back to Kosice, I went back to Prague. I came to America with my winter coat. And um, I'm going to fast forward a little bit. So um, how did you 
Um, how did you meet your wife? Can you tell me a little, about, a little bit about your family? I was working in Sipas uh, summer, and I was Shiva Tarvadas. I was working in the, in the hotel, kosher hotel. My partner, partner had a couple of kosher hotels in Sharon Springs, and one of the vacations there was a Rabbi Walkins. He was from Crown Heights, very distinguished looking rabbi with a white beard like this. And uh, he had uh, seven or eight children and with him. He came on vacation. And his middle daughter, Esther, was a very beautiful blonde girl. And uh, they saw that I was working very hard in the, in the dining room. And the girls helped me out. And Esther was my big helper, set the tables, put a take out the dirty dishes. And uh, <laughs> when they left, they go back to the city. Finished the vacation, I told Esther, Esther, when I'm 20 years old and you're 16 years old, I'm going to go after you. I'm going to call you. So Esther says, okay, you, you, you can call me. So it happened. I finished college because I was going to college in the evening and the afternoon. I finished college, so I figured it's the time to call. So I called Esther Walken and I said, remember me, Esther? I'm Oscar Heller. You helped me out in my job as a waiter in Barnes Hotel. Yeah, yeah, I remember you. You owe me a date. He said, when I'm 20 years old, I should call you. I called. He says, when do you want to go out? Anytime you want. So we had a date. At the end of the date, she comes over. She says, Oscar, you know, I have to tell you what. My father is looking for a rabbi. Son of all his family is rabbis. You're an engineer. It's not for my father. But I got a friend in school who graduated with me, high school. She's for you, she said. My father's a business. I said, okay, set me up with that. And that, that was my wife. Within three months, we were engaged, and I was in a wedding, and that was it. I mean, 60 years we were married. Beautiful. So, can you tell me a little about your kids? <laughs> Ali is the Bukhar. He's, uh, he's got three children. His son is a plastic surgeon. My son is a plastic surgeon. His, he has a son, he has a daughter uh, who is practicing medicine in, uh, uh, he has a medical residency at uh, Yale University Hospital. He's in third year residency, he's finishing this year. And uh, her son-in-law, he has a son-in-law, a uh, Harvard, also a, 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 a trace for medicine. Third year, third year. Resident, medical student. A resident? Residency at Harvard. Mm -hmm. So I got one in Yale, one in Harvard, and one who's a Manhattan plastic surgeon. And uh, then I have a, a daughter who is uh, talking about my daughter, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Bela. That's her daughter. And we have my son, Yoda. No, I'm sorry. Bela has three sons. A son, a married son, and a son that just finished dental school. Columbia, he's working at Columbia University Hospital. And I, and I have a, he has a son who's in law school, NYU Law School. That's my second daughter, my second child. My third child is uh, early. My memory is, I told you, you that. You have a daughter, an angle one. Another, my, my daughter is Heike. Heike is a, law, a, law, she's a lawyer. She was an assistant district attorney in Brooklyn, and uh, she has uh, okay. she's an district attorney in Brooklyn. Uh, she's a lawyer, and who is her? I'm a little confused. I'm sorry. It's okay. We can come back yeah, to um, it. We're gonna. Question twenty-one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll 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 sum it up. So, what is your message to my generation? To your generation is make an honest living, 
keep, keep religion as it's told us, as our forefathers told us, and uh, try to help people if you can. Um, what can we do to, to prevent Holocaust denial? I think they're abnormal if they can deny this. They're not normal people. They're crazy people, something that is open, something that's seen by millions of people. Nothing. Um, do you what, have any? Mr. Nally, what can we do to prevent these things from happening again? What is that? What can we do to prevent these things, the, uh, the Holocaust or I know. atrocities like this from happening again? It's a big problem. It's a big problem. Because you can see Germany already has anti-Semitism. And they passed the Holocaust, killing six million people. They have, they have anti-Semites in every country. This is after the Holocaust, after all this. There's, I don't know how much. I'm very pessimistic about that. Um, do you have any pictures to show us, photos? Not here. Um, and I heard? Yes, because yeah. you brought the article with you. Yeah. Can you test oh, it? Oh, what happened was, I, I, I gave you, I gave you the story. What happened? The story. The uh, same monster I saved his life. This I leave here, okay? They had the whole bunch, but I didn't see there. You wanted to see with somebody? Yes. Anybody wants him? Can they keep this? Yeah, 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 yeah. I have two of them. I give both you two. Okay. Another one. Did he tell the story? No, his yeah. father's are um, there. Okay. I told the story. No. The okay. Reunited, when you were reunited mm. with them. When you were reunited with these friends, if you can just tell the kids how oh, you were reunited oh, oh. with them. Uh, <clears throat> so I was looking after the world was separated. We, we, found, we, we found each other once in Koshice, in Shiva. I was in Shiva. It was separated, but we, I was walking on the street Friday afternoon. I was walking on the street Friday afternoon in Koshice, in Shiva. I was taking my laundry to the cleaning store, and on the other side of the, of the street, it was a Jewish section with cobblestones, narrow, narrow, narrow like, uh, and it moves. And uh, all of a sudden there was a, only a, a medium age, middle aged person smoking on the other side with a very handsome, tall, dark young fellow. And they stopped, and I also stopped. I was, looking, I was looking at them, they were looking at me, so they closed the street and they came out to my side. So the middle aged man who was having room asked me, Tell me, young man. Or you in Kaforda, in Kaforda, in, in Kach, in Dachau, doing the war? He says, yes. Were you in camp number four? Yes, I was in camp number four. He falls on my, on my neck. He says, this is my son. You saved his life. Look at him. So he was crying. I was crying. And the son standing there was smiling. Very handsome guy. So he, he took me to his house. He then, he didn't have his family, was lost. He had only child left as his son. So he said, you saved his son. He said, his life. I owe you a lot. He said, no, no, don't worry about it. So he took me to his house. I was going back to Hungary a couple of days later for my younger sister's wedding. And there was another difficulty of getting in Hungary. He needle and yarn. So he gave me a whole big package of needle and yarn to take to Hungary. And we'll see you when you come back. When I came back to Czechoslovakia to get my visa to America, he wasn't there anymore. They told me that they probably went to uh, Sydney, Australia. They were talking about going to Australia. So I started, I forgot about the whole thing. I was busy with school. I had school, yeshiva, everything else. So I was, I forgot about the whole thing. After a while, after I was finished school, I started wondering what happened to the people. I have, I, I got them all accounted for. Greenwald, whose father, grandfather, was the Salem Roof, was there with his son, 
they, not only that, they were also incarcerated in Shiva, and his father used to come and visit him. He used to tell him, he's well, my tutor, his son was my tutor, he was an older boy. He says, to admire, learn well with Shiva, he helped us along with food through the war. So there was another couple, and Harman Bloom. So what happened was, I forgot about it, I think I was busy getting my degree, getting my smicha, everything in one package, and also fighting for a living. I had to get my, get my latest job everywhere. But once I settled down, I said to myself, what happened to all these people? I said, we got together, I called them up, we got together, and we celebrated. But one day, I was wondering, what happened to Farman Rome? Nobody knew. I said, they said that he settled in, in, in Australia, Somebody says that in Israel, nobody knew. There was a bar mitzvah at Englewood with my younger daughter hiking. And they, not hiking is bar mitzvah, but they put up the guests from Sydney to hike his house. Hike has a big house in Englewood with a, with a, with a I don't know how you call that, made, it made and, and, and built a big, big house, a mansion. So they put him up there, the Baram Simcha, put up his, his, his cousins from Sydney in Haiki's house. So Haiki says to him, you're from Sydney, Australia? My father is looking for somebody, 60 years, and they can in Sydney, Australia, they say he is, but I can't, I, I, I call Sydney, they don't know him. So he says, Farm Room, I don't know why they know, know him, because Farm Room, there's not, not, there's not a Farm Room in Sydney. Farm room is, is, is uh, Sam Moss. His name is Moss now, it's not Sydney. It's not, uh, not Farm Room. He changed his name. He became very rich. It, his name actually came to Austri Australia was Moscovitz. There were three friends in Prague. Each one, one of them, Moscovitz, Sam Moscovitz had three passports and each one had a visa. One passport had a visa to Canada, one passport had a visa to Australia, and one passport had a visa to New York. It was in Prague. It was, they were in Prague. So, uh, so, <coughs> Sam got a visa, Farman Room got a visa to, to uh, Australia. Same passport, three visas. And uh, the other one got a visa to, to uh, of course it's the one got a visa, kept, kept his own, kept to, uh, to uh, his own name, which was Samuel. So what happened, so what happened to my daughter asked Sydney, why have my, my my father is looking for him since six years. Maybe you know him. He says, you don't know him, but you can never find him because his name is not anymore Farm Room. His name is Sam Moss. His name was Moskowitz, he changed it to, he came on papers, Moskowitz, he changed it to Moss. He became very rich. He had his private plane at one time. And uh, he changed it to Sam Moss. Moss is an Australian name. He says, so, so you're his, uh, you're his uh, friend. Yes, something. Call him. Call him, give him my telephone number. Next day I get a call from Australia to New York. Ask her, hello, this is Sam Moss, Farmer Bloom. I heard you're alive, you're here. I'm coming over to New York this week. She came within a couple of days. Every year we spent a week together in, in uh, Brooklyn and to uh, restaurants, enjoyed ourselves. And uh, until, <coughs> until, he became sick, he couldn't come anymore to New York, but he kept in contact. But uh, <coughs> then until, uh, yeah, so he, he, he stayed together until he got sick. And he got sick, he was 90 years old. They made him a big party. I, we have a, they sent me a video. I was in the video with the birthday party, 90th birthday party. A couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from Sam Moss. Ask her, hello, yeah. I came to say thank you to you. I was only 
degree to live 80 years, but you extended my life 72 years. I'm 90 now, and I'm going to die in a couple of weeks, my doctor tell me. So before I die, I wanted to thank you for adding 72 years of my life. I said, don't have to matter, but he was cool. No crying, no, no, he was ready. I'm ready to go. I said, 80 or 90, I was supposed to die at 72, at 62. Yeah, I said, uh, 62. So there was a story with the Samos. We call each other with his brother, Nancy, uh, once in a while. Okay, thank you so much for letting us interview you. Thank you, thank you for listening to me. Mr. Heller, thank you very, very, very much. The story is amazing. And and you got the arrival to Auschwitz, uh, the transfer to Dachau, the liberation of Dachau. It's a long story. I have a, I have a big video on this from uh, Spielman, Spielman, Spielberg. He called me up and thanked me for the video. I think that we're probably just as good as Spielberg. I think they did a great job, great these job. kids. Yeah, very good. They did a great very job. Thank you so much. We're going to take a picture, if that's okay. And okay, yeah. Kira, why don't you give this? And you'll tell them there's a note. Okay, let me just get the camera also. Get some air. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. That's very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wait, so when do you decide both sides? Jesse. Interesting story is that somebody asked me, the question they asked me last week, did you ever think of denying God because of what you saw him? I'm not going to go into that. I can't go into that. Yeah, yeah. It's too complicated. Get closer, guys. Mr. Heller. No, no. no cookies? Actually, I'll show the three ones too, because I know yesterday's one was right ahead. Oh, she was? <laughs> Let's see what we can do with that. Yeah, okay. Uh, yes. Hey, Donnie, where do I clip this on? I know I put it in my shirt. Try it. Put through your shirt.
Yeah, I know. I will. Yeah. We're going to ask you about that. Yeah, but they'll ask you that question. Yellow star. I just remember to ask that first. Oh, this is it. I mentioned one thing about the, uh, on the train, it was three days and three nights to go and cattle the cows from Auschwitz to Dachau. Dachau is near München, Munich. And uh, what happened was, every day... Uh, oh, you are. Every day? Every day, they opened the cattle wagon once, twice. Put in a can of water, were 80 people in the car, I put a can of water, came to my turn. I was a, a boy, 13 years old. I never had water. I started crying. I begged out, I need some water too. So I found there was one strong guy there, a very nice guy, one of, the, one of our prisoners, that said, from now on, the boy is going to get first choice to drink water and the can is in. And he said, he was a strong man. He must have been some big man back home. And I was the first one to get the can of water after that. So they, they, they are Jews. So the Jewish people are noble people. Oh, okay. So my name is Yona Fenster. Um, I'm going to back up a little bit. First, I'm going to ask, did you ever have to wear um, a yellow star? Yes, in Munich, in the ghetto. Before the ghetto, as soon when the Germans came in within a week, the regulation came in, you had to wear a yellow star. They didn't waste any time. Okay. Um, can you tell us how about you got on the train to Dachau? Uh, for Dachau. Yeah. As I said, we, uh, I got away from the selection, and I, uh, Dr. Mengele was after me. I got away from him because there was some screaming in the line. So while they were screaming in the line, and my guide, my guard, SS or sergeant, held the gun on my head, and he said, you move, I shoot. 
so I couldn't go anywhere. But then the screaming started in the lines. So Dr. Mega was looking at the lines. He pulled out some people that didn't want to go. So they were screaming, crying. So the sergeant didn't know what happened. He ran over to the lines, see what happened. While he was away, I ran around the kitchen, I ran around the kitchen to the gate of the camp and waited until they marched out. They started marching to the railroad beside him. And I pushed him to the line and I ended up in the train. So, um, what happened when you arrived at Dachau? Like, what did you see what and how were you able to see What happened in Dachau, uh, we had no idea where we were. We arrived late at night. We marched into camp number four. I had no idea it was camp number four. But we marched to the camp, the whole transport, all the, uh, was about, uh, there were about six, seven hundred people there, marching in there. And they were, as they were marching, marching us through the gate of camp number four, they were counting us. And there was a recounting us, there was an SS officer standing there with his hand in the back and watching the whole thing. He was, I don't know who he was, but he just watched. He was an officer, SS. He, as I passed by, he calls me over, Junge, come on here. He called me, Junge is a trouble. I never liked to be called young. Young is no good. You have to be mature to get into the camp. So he calls me over, pulls me out of the line, and we were marching already inside the camp. And he says, if he has to, same thing. I'm on your side one year, he says, hey, Fritze has stone fear. I said, right away, he says, Fritze has stone fear. He says, come with me. I should go with him. I should go with him. He takes me to a, get, to a big building right at the entrance of the camp, and opens the door, says, give me a line. I should go inside. He says, home are the I should tell him to take off my cousin, my jacket. It was cold, it was October night. I take off my jacket and I started shaking uncontrollably. I figured he's going to shoot me. Because I was again the only child coming to Tesla. So I just stayed there. He took out my jacket, ran into a door. He comes out a couple of minutes later. The jacket was full of bread, margarine, whoosh, all kinds of foods. And he gives me the, the bag of my jacket full of food. He says, give my name, I should go to my, my barrack, signed. When the hunger has come to me, when, when you have hunger, come to me. He was, he was the head of the food magazines of both the prisoners and the guards, SS. So every evening I come home from work, I took my, everybody had a little pot, which he got the soup. I, I ate my soup. And he was also always there, looking over what's going on. He was the food manager, so he looked over what's going on. So he sees me there. He comes over. Has the hunger, Junge? Am I hungry? He says, "Yeah, always don't fear. Oh my, she so. I should bring a pot, issue pot. I get you so. So the pot in my back. That was the pot. Took me to the distribution pot and dipped it into the soup. He says, "Go on down the rack. Can go back to my barrack." This was going on for a couple of months. It wasn't bad because I had enough food. He gave me, besides that, he gave me food. But uh, I was assigned to Commando Mall. There was a, a, a construction company near Munich, near Munich. And uh, we were supposed to carry 50 kilogram cement bags. They were building a factory under the mountain, bomb proof, and they had to make seven layers of uh, cement of, uh, for the structure. But uh, my couple, couple was an overseer. There was, there was prisoners also, couples, Jews or couples. My couple told me, you don't have to carry a 50 kilogram cement pack on your mind. Just sit down here. Here's a piece of lumber. Sit down and you don't have to do anything. This went on for several weeks. One day, the SS guard commando comes over inspect. He sees me sitting. So uh, he goes over to the couple who was a Jewish fellow, a young fellow. He says, well, who's this there? How come he, he's sitting there, not working? He says, there's a tiny young guy. He's a small boy. He cannot pick up the 50 kilogram. He cannot pick up. Let's see. So he takes his whip and he starts beating the couple, not me. He didn't believe me. He meet her. Show me that he can't do it. And he keeps on beating him. So the couple ran, 
get a 50 kilogram sack of cement, put it on the shoulder of, the, of me, and as soon as he let go, I collapsed with the, I, I couldn't hold 50 kilograms. I was maybe 100 pounds. So I, I fell, and the cement sack split, and the cement shot into my eyes. I got blind, finished blind. I know what to do. The, the, the couple said to take me to my barrack. The couple took me to the barrack and told them what happened. The barrack commander, so I told the barrack commander, go find Stumfier, the Prosu. His name was Prosu, the Stumfier, the food magazine's head. Tell him what happened to me. Tell him that the red-headed fellow is in trouble. So a couple of minutes later, the colonel comes in. He, he, uh, what happened? So I told him that they tried to put me 50 kilograms of cement and I collapsed with the cement. It's full of cement. It's full. My eyes were of cement. I'm blind. And I knew what happens to blind people. They get blind at work. They took them out of the forest and a bullet in the back. And that was it. So I said, go to the, to the guard house, ask for Schumfier approach and tell him what happened. Ten minutes later, Soon the approach comes back with the book at us. Book at us, there was the chief of back. And he says, what's the shit, young girl? What happened, young fellow? So I told him again that I couldn't pick up a 50 kilogram cement. So he leaves, the, the uh, Stoomfield leaves, comes back with the camp commander. There was a big shot. He was the commander of the camp, a colonel. And he, uh, no, colonel, he was a hopman, he was a captain. So he comes into the barrack, my barrack, and tells me again the same thing. What's the shit, Junge? Again, young fellow, what's the shit? So the professor explained to him that they tried to put a 50 kilogram cement sack on my shoulder. I couldn't uh, collapse with it. So he was very nice. He says, uh, So the Junge toughened by cement, I might not. Such young boys shouldn't work by cement. So what happened was they called the doctor, Dr. Elikas, from Klosenburg, he was the camp doctor there, prisoner by the camp doctor, they called him, and the camp commandant, commandant asked him to write a prescription of cleaning up his eyes. The, camp, the, the, uh, the doctor, the camp doctor, Dr. Colt, uh, Dr. Elikesh, he wrote a prescription, the commandant himself went to the city of Salzburg, took out the prescription, and used it for a week, is that my eyes cleaned up and I went back to work. But the, the force would say to me, Junge, du gehst nicht out, 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 outside arbeiten. You will not work outside anymore. You will work, you will in and out arbeit. He made me a job in the kitchen. That's all I needed. My job in the kitchen was I stood at the gate of the kitchen where about 100 people were working, maybe 75 hundred people. And my job was standing at the gate of the kitchen and SS people arrived to inspect, I had to scream Achtung. When I screamed Achtung, everybody stopped, took off his cap, and stood until the SS man said, Weitermachen. And he said, Weitermachen, you get better, cap out, went to work. And uh, this was my job. They liked my voice very much, I had a sharp voice. Every time the person came in and I screamed Achtung, he put a smile on me. Good, good job, you're doing a good job. Anyway, so uh, what happened was, I was in the kitchen. Everybody was, and I was in front of the kitchen the whole day. And I was uh, excess food. I had access to food. People came to me left and right begging me for food. I tried to give everybody, I could, uh, give me the vat, I could be chisel, went into the big stainless steel vats cooking soup. I dipped the, I went into my little stool, dipped in the, about cooking and give everybody, I guess, supported sorts of people this way. And the kitchen manager, Feldman Bachi, he was a Hungarian, we called the Bachi, Uncle Feldman, says, Kitchi, they called me Kitchi, small one in camp. Kitchi, I'm not going to stop you, but don't, don't beg me to help you when you caught. And you caught, you're finished. So I says, I won't bother you. Kept on giving one day. I was in the middle of giving somebody a pot of soup. I was standing on the, on the uh, stool, 
I had the shiso, the issue that the prisoners had a pot, and I stood on the, on the, uh, on, the uh, on the stool, and I dipped it in. As I dipped it in, an SS officer enters the door. I didn't know that he's expected. All of a sudden, I see an SS officer. All of a sudden, I see an SS officer inside the kitchen. And I was on the stool holding a pot of soup from the big vat. And I know, so I scream, Achtung! I scream, Achtung! So the SS officer comes in and looks at me. And he gradually figured out what happened. And I took a, ch a chisel from outside and I dipped it into the big vat and I was going somebody, eating somebody else. This was verboten. This was the worst of air because you took a dirty pot from outside. And you you dipped it into the clean stainless steel hot soup that are cooking. They were crazy for cleanliness, the SS officers. You couldn't, you made any, any violation of cleanliness, they beat you to death. But everything else went. So what happened? The SS is standing there, the SS officer, looking at me. He goes for his gun and put out his pistol. And I knew that he can shoot me because they, they don't have to account for that. They can say I was. I was not listening to, not listening to uh, orders. So he holds his gun, looks at me, and everybody's quiet. You could hear a fly. Finally, he comes over to me. He puts his gun back into the holster. He comes over to me, grabs a sheet of soup, goes off, spits it back into the, into the uh, cook, uh, hot cooking soup, and takes the, takes the pot, knocks it to the floor, and he says, right and he walked out. He walked out and I said a word to me. They all came over to me and said, you thought you finished. This was an end You made it. So I was very careful. I never did that. I never gave a soup unless I knew who was outside. Because he can, in one minute, they had all my motorcycles. They came in the motorcycle very fast. So this was my brush with that in Dachau. This was my, besides that, one day, people came to ask me for uh, soup or whatever it is, and uh, I tried to give as much as I can. I, I wasn't uh, too happy to do this, but I had to do it. I had a couple of father and son combinations I had to support. The, uh, the combination of um, Greenwald, where the father was a sailor and a rose son, and the son was a was the grandson of the Tzela Meru, Tzela was a big rabbi of Hungary. And one day, a middle-aged man comes over to me, I was standing in front of the kitchen, he says, Kitchi, I'm Flavenblum from Munkaj. My name is Flavenblum from Munkaj. So he says, okay, how are you, Flavenblum? My son is dying in the barrack, you must help me. He just got up with typhus fever, everybody had typhus fever, camp number four. And he's emaciated, there's nothing left of him. You must help me. You must give me a heavy soup and some other food every day. So I says, what do you want for my life? I'm going to get killed one day. They're looking at me. They, 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 they suspect that I'm doing these things. I can't help you. You can't help me. He, he grabs me by my, my, my lapel. He pulls me to his barrack. And I see, this is my son. Tall boy, skinny boy, 18 years old. He couldn't open his eyes. He was so, so weak. If you ever see a body with a skeleton, he was a skeleton, there's nothing there left. He says, you must give me food, you must, he doesn't, I don't want him to tell die, this is my only son now. So I said, okay, come to me every morning, and I'll give you, I'll give you food, a package, every morning. Came every morning, came, he slowly recovered, and uh, then the end of the war came, and they were, we were, we were uh, transferred to Dachau proper, the main camp, and they were, they were not ambulatory, so they were cancer into another camp. So I lost track of him. We were liberated, and uh, I went back to uh, Hungary. It, for a Hungarian citizen to go back to home was difficult because Hungary was a defeated country. They couldn't take care of their citizens. But if you're a Czech and you were liberated, they took you wherever they had to go. So I announced myself as Czech, Slovak. My, my parents come from Slovakia, and I 
became uh, he, <coughs> part, 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 part of that barrack, part of the barrack that went to Czechoslovakia. The British uh, section of the, uh, of the uh, Czech army was uh, collected us and we, we and, and uh, wagons and we, one day was the evacuation back to Czechoslovakia. I volunteered. They took us from, from München to Pilsen. Pilsen is a famous beer in Czechoslovakia. From Pilsen they took us to Prague. From Prague they took us to Bratislava, which is Pressburg in German. From Bratislava they took us to Budapest. Uh, Budapest they, they, they took us down. The Jewish appeal had a, uh, had a whole building in Budapest. They gave me new clothes. They put me up to sleep. They had a kitchen, they had a kosher kitchen in the city, so I ate kitchen every day. And then they gave me 1,500 crowns uh, money and told me to get back to your city to Nierichhausa. So I took a train to Nierichhausa, but I couldn't get the train, didn't go to Nierichhausa anymore. Heller, it stopped in Debrecen. Could you describe the moment you, uh, the, what you felt when you were liberated? Could you describe the, what you felt when you were liberated? How it felt to be I, I'm coming to that. Oh, oh, oh I passed that. Oh, you passed it. Uh, yeah. What happened was, uh, three, four days before the uh, Americans came in, the guards left the towers. There was no guards. We were on our own. We didn't know what to do. We were afraid to go out of the camp. And there was an artillery placement right behind the camp, Allah. And meanwhile, the American army came from this side. The last night before liberation, there was a big artillery fight between the two artillery settings uh, all night. A lot of the shells fell in camp, in my, my camp, in Gala's camp. I stuck my window once to see what's going on. A shell passed. I nearly cut my hair off with the pressure. I didn't uh, lie, the floor, lie on the floor the next time. The morning it became quiet. Some of the prisoners left camp because there was, the bulb wires were broken by the shells. And they found that the German emplacement all dead, all the Germans dead, the artillery people. And we went back to camp, and we were waiting. It. We saw a scout plane on top of us, circling a couple of times. And about two hours later, we hear zzzz, zooming. We looked out the camp, and there were tanks coming. And American soldiers on the side of the tanks with their guns and chewing gum. Everybody was chewing gum, so we tried to figure out what's that. The Americans, their mouth always moves. That's how Americans are. They're moving mouths. <laughs> Finally, they arrived. He broke, broke. So everybody jumped on the trucks, Americans brought in trucks to eat food. A lot of people died while eating because they overstressed themselves. And the American commander saw by the evening what's going on. So he took away the trucks of food and he forbid anybody to give any food to prisoners now until they figure out what's the problem. So I didn't wait. I took my little bundle and I walked in four kilometers to München. Dachau was about four kilometers from München. And I arrived, to Min I arrived at the outskirts of München. The edge of the city was a big inn with uh, sleeping, uh, a little hotel. They had inns those days, they, they, they served meals. And the inn was occupied by the American army. They took right away the inn and the American army. And I found out, stopping there, that the, the Americans there are the headquarters division of the 24th Infantry Division. Headquarters division, they supplied, they managed the, the whole division. They supplied the food, they all, the, all the housekeeping there for the headquarters division. So the headquarters division told me there was a Hungarian guy, soldier in the headquarters division, and they heard that I speak Hungarian. He says, where are you coming from? He says, I come from the same province that I was before the war. So he took me into the kitchen. He fed me, uh, not kosher meat, but 
saw me right away, and he said, you stay with us until things clarify. So I stayed with them. I got lodging in a big building not far from there, a northern building, which wasn't bombed. Every building was bombed. And uh, I finally I got, I heard that there's a school assembling Czech citizens to go home. So I found out where the school was. I left the uh, Dachau area. I went to Munich. And I waited for the, for the uh, transport to arrive. Mr. Heller, so Mr. Heller what, what did the Americans say when they arrived? The I didn't say time? much. I couldn't. No, what, what did the Americans say to you? Say to all to all. Lose, lose. What's going on? What's going on? Everybody had this scream to stop the food, not stop the food, and they kissed the Americans. I right away left the camp. I didn't want to be one minute with me on the camp. I took my little bonds when I left. I, I went by foot to, to Munich. I knew that Munich was four kilometers from Dachau. So what happened was uh, I uh, found out where the school is, where they're assembling people to go back home, the Czech, Czech army. I found I waited there, we boarded the trucks. In the morning there was the Czech section of the British Army. They were actually Czechs, the trucks. But the sections of the British Army. They were there the whole war. Uh, the the, the uh, train left, as I said, we stopped in Pilsen, Prague, Bratislava, Budapest. In Budapest, I said, we took a train, a freight train. There was no trains yet in Hungary. It was a defeated country. In Budapest, I got a train, a freight train to Debrecen as far as it goes. Near the house of my town is 30 kilometers from Debrecen. So I found a freight train going to Debrecen, to, to, to near the house from Debrecen. I boarded the freight train, it was an open freight train. I finally arrived in near the house with my bundles. But before, I forgot to tell you, before we, we boarded the train in Bratislava, there was no room in the train. Rus a lot of Russian soldiers were in the train. So I had to go on the roof of the train, tie myself around the chimney, and, and go on the roof. So as we were standing waiting to board, to leave the train, to leave, a Russian soldier comes up to the roof and sees my bundle. He takes the bundle, he throws it down. There was a lot of friend of his waiting downstairs and took the bundle. Had he known there was nothing in that bundle except maybe a couple of dirty shirts and maybe a piece of bread. I lost my bundle. Anyway, we lost, in Budapest I got new clothes, I got money to take the train. So then I arrived in Yerichhausen with the freight train. I boarded the, tri the trolley car. There's a trolley car going from the railroad station to my house. The, the trolley car, the, the uh, railroad station was bombed out to a level. Everything was bombed out. So I went to the, on the trolley car, and the conductor recognized me. He says, Kishela, little Heller, what, you also made it home? Yes, I made it home. This was the conductor. He didn't say good congratulations or whatever, just went home. So he told me where to go, to go to Paskas. That's where the Jews who come home go to, and he helps them out. So I went to Paskas, as I said before. Paskas sent me to, uh, to uh, Shonik to find my two sisters. He told me that my two sisters, the conductor told me that the two sisters are alive. I had a monthly ticket to go to school with a, with a receipt car every morning and evening back home. So then I, I said I was looking for my sister, I found her finally. Yeah, I want to make a ski. Oh. Uh. I missed uh, saying anything about my two older sisters and my older brother, what happened to them. Then you should, you yeah, should. Well, a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, I'm sure they'll bring that up, so I can ask him to tell you about his two older sisters. And my older brother, who went to the army.
Which I should be like high on like Jessica Burner. Is this good also? They wanted me to go. Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. You ready to continue, Mr. Heller? Yeah. Okay. I neglected to tell you about what happened to my two older sisters and my older brother. Can I let her introduce herself to you? Yeah. Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm Jessica Brenner. Jessica Brenner. Brenner. Her father is Zev Brenner, if you ever listen to the radio host. I heard you too. <laughs> Uh, just to go back a little, what happened to your brother and your sisters? My brother went into the army the last day before the ghetto started. He was uh, called by the Hungarian army. They wanted to keep as many young men as possible for themselves and give it to the Germans. So he went to the army and my two sisters, my father had an ink, something is wrong. And he had, uh, he bothered him very much. He, he wasn't a big talker, but I, I think even as a child, it was something was about it. So he bought some false papers for my two sisters, older sisters, and sent them up to Budapest as non-Jews. They got into to Budapest, they had all the right papers. My father paid heavy money for the papers. And they settled in Budapest. And then he asked my mother and my, my sister, the two of us, to uh, follow my sisters, my older sisters. So my, but I can't go, my father said. I can't live like a boy. I'm not going, but you take the two children and follow your two sisters in Budapest. My, my mother said, if you don't go, I don't go. I'm not going to leave you alone here. This went on until the last day, and they couldn't go anymore. And of course, my, my two older sisters were in Budapest, as Goyim, and my uh, younger sister went to the Cash chamber right away with my mother. And I and my father went to camp, so this was our end. I even remember eavesdropping over. My father had a very good friend in the city, Dr. Silaji. He was the head of the biggest bank in, Hung in Hungary, in my tiny it was a national bank. I overheard through the door, he came to see my father. I told him, I have an estate in outside the city. I'm going to hide you and your family. If it goes over. My father says, dear doctor, you don't have to do it. If everything will be all right. They'll take us, we work it out, but then we come back after the war. And then my father still didn't want to believe what's happening. He had an inkling, but he didn't want to believe. So first of all, I made my two older sisters say, he sent me to work as well. And the interesting thing was that my brother, who was in the army, the Hungarian army was stationed near Budapest. So my sisters used to send all kinds of packages with his sergeant, and the sergeant came and follow the Budapest. My father, my mother, no, my sister sent food for my brother in the army, kosher food, because there was no kosher food in the army. And he, he almost made it. What happened was, 
and I think my brother-in-law who married my sister here, parents, was also in the same in the same company in the in Hungarian army, and the Russians were approaching Hotland where he was. The, the Tisza River was separating the Russians and the, the Germans, the Hungarians, and uh, the, the battalion got an order to withdraw to Budapest. And my brother and one other boy, the same age in my city, Goldberger, thought, why should we go now with, back to Budapest? The Russians are across the river. They'll be here in two days, and then we can go with the Russians and be free. They, they deserted, they didn't go to Budapest. They caught them, they, somebody said they shot them right away, they caught my them. I have never heard of them anymore. And uh, my brother-in-law did come to Budapest, and uh, interesting story, he married my sister after the war. He, uh, he, was, was, uh, he arrived in Budapest, they got an order from the army to go to Budapest and report at a certain army camp. With what, what you could you could report until tomorrow. So my brother arrived in the evening before tomorrow, and his sister, his he had two sisters also. She was going in Budapest. He right away sent a message to his sister that he's in Budapest, and my sister sent a a, 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 a soldier that was in her pay take him out, take him home, take him to the way they, they live. So he deserted the army too. But before that, he had to get a night's sleep. So he got a, he got, he got a hotel, 300 beds. They were all three for people. They were all they were Jews, they are Polish, they are all running from something. And my brother-in-law was very tired, so he took a bed and went to sleep. In the middle of the night, they were knocking at the door and who is the military police, Hungarian military police. So as we know, everybody else jumped out the window. They knew already when they're knocking the night at the door, somebody is here to, to look at them. So everybody jumped out the window except my brother-in-law. He didn't know what's going on. So I asked my brother-in-law for the papers. So he showed him his army papers. And he told him that he's supposed to report next morning at the army base. So they looked at his pocket. And they found the false papers, Goetia papers in his pocket. They took him to the headquarters, the army headquarters, and uh, he was under uh, under arrest for police, for whatever it was. My my uh, brother was my sister-in-law found out that he's under arrest. My brother-in-law, she sent an emissary. There was a guy named Lowinger in Budapest. He had a whole. Uh, a whole detailed SS people under his command, false, false papers, all false papers. So my sister asked him to get my, my brother-in-law out of the jail, the army jail. My sister went with false orders, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of false things. Uh, he needs to be interrogated in another army camp. They let him out with my sister. And uh, they were liberated in Budapest. They were hiding until the Russians came in in the end of January, beginning of February, and they came back to the nearest house of the city. That was, stuff, that was a story with my two sisters. My two sisters came home after the liberation, after the Russians took Budapest. And uh, my future sister also came back. So everybody came back, but not the ones that went to Auschwitz. This is what happened to my two sisters. And my br older brother, my older brother I never heard from him again. Something happened, they caught him. Somebody said they caught him, I said, I mean, they shot him on the truck. That's what happened to my siblings. Well, my, my little sister was already dead upon arrival. Okay, so to move forward a little, um, when you were in the barrack with the, all the boys, uh, how were you able to escape Mengele's selection? There was various ways. First of all, I got into the camp, I got into the Auschwitz camp by accident. I followed somebody who went on the living side. And Dr. Mengele was interrupted with somebody asking a question. And I just went to the same place where the previous man and a young man, strong man, no children. I didn't know, so I followed him and I, I was saved. My two uncles went straight to the gas chamber because they helped. 
the same age boys as I was with my father, with my father, who had his two brothers. And then I stayed in Auschwitz for five months. How did I, there were various selections there. How did I describe the, every selection had a different method of escape. The first selection, I couldn't make it because I wasn't, I wasn't a big grow up. I didn't look like 16 years old. You had to be 16 to make it alive. You can't get out of it as a child. So I, <coughs> there was a big oven in the center of, of the barracks in the oven, in the camp, uh, Birkenau camp. And there was a big hole where they used to put food in the winter and heat it. I squeezed, I squeezed in, I was very thin there too. I squeezed into the hole and I stood there until they took away the, uh, all the boys, all the boys from the camp. And then I, I climbed out of the, of the uh, oven and I had to find a place to go. Oh. So I went back to the remnants of the boys and I, and I went to that barrack and I stayed in that barrack. So that, was, that wasn't too difficult. Second selection, it was more difficult. But also the same thing happened. Some, it was a lot, a lot of luck. Uh, I was uh, with the ones that were, were, were on the wrong side. So they marched us out of the barrack once it was finished, the selection was finished. And I knew I, I knew I'm with the small ones, I knew I won't make it. So as they were marching out of the barrack, made a left turn, I just went straight. Nobody noticed me, go straight. So I got away from that group that went to the gas chamber. I have no idea how, I just got them one second. I took the But this was Erev Yom Kippur. In Kippur evening, I had no barrack to go to. Because that boys' barrack was finished. It was raining cats and dogs. I was knocking in the barrack doors. Let me in, let me in. Nobody opened the door of the barracks. Finally, I was knocking and crying because it was raining and also I wanted to catch me outside. There was nobody outside anymore. It was curfew. After 8 o'clock, there was a curfew. Uh, so finally one local tester, chief of the barrack, opened the gate of the barrack and pushed me in and threw me to the floor to stay there. I said, I, had, I, oh, I, had, I stayed with that barrack until the next selection, when I was leaving Auschwitz, and I made it leaving Auschwitz. I don't know if I ever mentioned how I left Auschwitz. I entered Auschwitz by accident with Dr. Menger on my tail, and I left Auschwitz also with Dr. Menger on my tail. What happened was I tried to get out of Auschwitz, I couldn't get out of Auschwitz. Nobody would take a child like me, 13 years old, and uh, 12 years. So I knew, uh, one day I heard that they were uh, assembling, assembling a transport to Dachau, and they were looking for volunteers. I found out the barrack where they are, I went to a sneak into that barrack and uh, they were already all assembled. The selection was now. Just before they let you out of Auschwitz, they had to be selected and told that you can work. So uh, my, my turn came. That day, Dr. Megal wasn't the one that did the selection. Dr. Epstein, Professor Epstein, he was a professor of medicine in Prague University, Charles University. His teacher, Dr. Epstein, was a uh, President in Auschwitz, Dr. Menger's teacher. Dr. Menger recognized him when he arrived in Auschwitz. He made him the head of all the all the uh, prisoners in Auschwitz. So he was doing the selection that day. He he selected his life and death, a Jew or not a Jew, but he did it. It was his job. So came my turn. So he looks at me. He says, "I says, I like it. I'll be long to be job by again. Please let me go to work." It's you. Says, but I'm, ich kann arbeiten, ich kann gut, gut arbeiten, ich bin stark. So he looks around, back and forth, okay, go to the link side. So I got, got into the right side, they took us to the barrack, and they gave us a whole bread, with some margarine and some other stuff, food stuff. They gave us winter clothes, heavy jackets and heavy, it was already September, October heavy uh, trousers and lined us up in two kitchens in the, each camp in 
In American hour was two kitchens, long kitchens, and the barracks. And uh, this was the exit of the camp. This was the uh, gate of the camp, camp number. I was in camp number D. D, E, F, A, B, C. I was in A, I was in C, and I was in D, and that was my last D. We were lined up near the gate of the camp to go to the railroad siding. The railroad siding was in back of the camp. That's where the people arrived in Auschwitz. That's how we left Auschwitz. So we were ready to go. Dr. Mengele shows up with his uh, aide. He had a big SS sergeant with a big head cross. And my arm, arm sign. And he looks around the line. We all lined up to go to the railroad, to, to the, to the railroad side. And, and he sees me in the group. He knew me already a couple of times, he called me. Before, we, I didn't say anything. So he comes over to me, Red Fox. What's my Fuda here? He called me Red Fox. Because every time, he, every time he sent me to the gas chamber, I was out of there in two hours. So I finally called me, he gave me a name, Red Red Fox. I was a fast runner. I ran away from him every time. So he says, do this, this real often from the, here you're not going to run away. So he told the sergeant, take your pistol, put it on his head, he moves, shoot. Meanwhile, he went around the lines, lined up to go out the gate, and pulled out some more people, older people, and sick people. They didn't want to go, so they were screaming there, they were crying, screaming. Finally, everybody got scared, what happened? They didn't know, the sergeant didn't know what happened. So he took his gun in his holster, he ran over to the lines, what happened? So he found out what happened. But while he took his arms back into his pocket, I ran around, I was here, standing, this was the two kitchens. I ran around the kitchen, this was the exit of the camp, and the camp, so the exit was already marching to the railroad siding. I went into a line, and I went to the wagon. I didn't have my bread, my bread ration. I had to leave everything over. I couldn't carry anything, I had to run. And I marched right into the cattle wagon to go to Dachau. I just wondered why they didn't look for me. When, I, when the sergeant came back, he didn't find me there. He should have looked for me, he should have known where I was going. Nobody. Yeah, maybe they figured, we'll get him next time. No problem. So that's how I got out of Auschwitz. Three days and three nights in the cattle wagon again and arrived in Auschwitz. So this is the, anybody has a question on Auschwitz? Because I'm going to move to Dachau here. Um, do you have a number? 115 million or Wait, wait, say it in English, slowly, slowly. It's, it's, not, it. it's not here, it's not in my, oh. it's, it was in my, my jacket. 115003. How come you didn't have one on your arm? Because I wasn't working, I wasn't a worker, I wasn't a you know, commando. And when I left Auschwitz, those that left legal, some of them got numbers, but I was not there. I was running to the, to the back of the camp, to the railroad siding. Well, so I yeah, had, I but I got a number right here when I arrived in Dachau. Well, do you remember the barrack number? Pardon me? Do you remember the barrack number? Uh, my number? No, the barrack. The barrack. The barrack. 27. Siemens Francis. In Birkenau? Birkenau. Like a D. D. How were you able to find a, a cousin in Auschwitz? And how did he help you survive? I have a cousin, Claire, who's still alive here in Sunnyside. She's 96 years old. And she had a baby. She had a little child. Her husband was in the Hungarian army on the Russian front. Never made it home. He died on the front. So she was in camp there, next to our camp, next to Camp D. Camp C was a woman's camp. And they were standing by the, by the uh, barbed wire, and I recognized her, and she recognized me. We were living in the same town. We used to see each other every couple of days. So I had, I had some extra food. This is another story. When I was in the barrack locked up with the boys, one day they screamed, hell, and somebody's looking for you. So I went to the gate of the camp. You couldn't go out. We were in the curfew. But they took us for a walk every evening for half an hour. So I, I, 
seen in the front of the bed, there's a young man, Heller, you're Heller, I'm Laufer. Are you from Miss Laverich in Czechoslovakia? He says, yes. He says, I'm your cousin. He says, I'm your cousin? Okay, they're called cousin. He was in the next camp. He was in Camp D. So he says, uh, what happened to my parents? He says, I don't know where they came for a couple of months and they were caught in a question back in Czechoslovakia. He says, he was working and emptying the packages of new arrivals. He was there in 1942. This was already 44. They caught him at the railroad station, and they sent him to Auschwitz in Slovakia. Slovakia. So right there he says, I'm going to bring you food every day. Just stand here. I'm going to send a message that I'm here. And you open the window on the back of the barrack, I'm going to give you the food. And this went on until the day I left Auschwitz. Until I changed barracks. He gave me food every day. So I had more food than I needed. I threw it over the web barbed wire to my cousin Clary. Claire. She was there until, I don't, I don't know what happened to her. She went to another camp after I went to Dachau. But after the war, she came back, and I came back too, and we met. But there was a bigger Jew, and I, I met my sisters. I didn't know they were alive. I arrived back in Hungary, in Nilithaus, after the war, and I knocked at my door, a gate. We had a big gate in our door. Big gate, nobody answered. So somebody told me, my sisters are in, in Paskas. Paskas was receiving all the newcomers back, the backcomers. And Paskas who makes the candy here, he had a big candy factory back in Erich also. So he put up all the new, newcomers back for a while. So he told me my sisters are in this and this house, but holding. Go and find together, get a regular a wagon and find them. So I went to Honig, the the the, fiaker, the uh, Kutchen, as I say in German, I went back to my house to look for my sisters. They told me now they were, they were... Oh, you make sure to speak to... Uh, oh, they were my pastors. So finally, I, uh, they told me that I went home. I, I ran into my house. At Oscar, uh, look, look at the girl. Well, don't look at the interviewer. <laughs> look, here, here. Oh. So I uh, opened the gate, I opened the gate. And there were my two sisters and inside the guy. So of course it was very dramatic. Did you ever go back to Auschwitz? I went back to Dachau with my wife. I told her I couldn't go back to Auschwitz. It's too much for me. I'm going to stop us here. We're going to do a switch because. Okay. Do you remember where this carriage was? 27 was next to the gate on the left side? No, was 27 was uh, quite a bit, almost at the end of the camp. There was a lined up camps, A, B, C, D. A was only one side, but B, and C, and D, and E, and F of the two sides. F was for the twins, separate camps for the kids, experiments on twins. Take a drink? No, I took a drink. I have two drinks here. I'll be sicker. I turned my head and you had a drink. Okay. I was stopped at the uh, end of our season, beginning of that house. We'll go back to that house. Is there a restroom here? A restroom? Yes. Oh, okay.
cane? His coat is his over coat here. Is right here. His cane? Where is his cane? He didn't bring it into this room. No. Did you walk in with a cane? No. <laughs> May have left it in the car. <laughs> Who took it? He took my car. No okay, they, they're locating your cane. I think it's in the front. Okay. The cane is in the front? Yeah. Makes sense. I'll go get it. Uh, can we get the DVD burner rolling and call it? And remember, soft sticks, okay? Names, not numbers, Mr. Heller, Mark.
Good afternoon, my name is Yakira Tepler. Thank you for coming to be interviewed for our Names Not Numbered project. I will begin with questions about before the war. What is your name? Oscar Hella, H-E-L-L-E-R. What is your Hebrew name? What is your Hebrew name? Chaim Yoshua. Mr. Heller, could you, could you please respond in a full sentence? My name is? Yeah. My name is Chaim Yoshua. What is your Hungarian name? Oscar. Uh, O-S-K-A-R. Yeah. Okay. Or in America, O-S-C-A-R. Okay. Um, where were you born? In the, in the city of Nierichhausen. I was born in the city of Nierichhausen in eastern Hungary. When were you born? November 26, 1930. Can you tell me a little bit about your family? My family, I can tell you about my extended family and my basic family. My father, my mother, I had, I had three sisters and one brother. My brother was the oldest, then came my sister Esther, then came my sister Sara, then came my name Chaim Yeshua, then came my sister, baby sister Malka. What did your father do for a living? He was a wine producer. We lived near the city of Toke, and all most of the good wines came about. My father was a major producer of wine. Mm. Mm. Can you tell them a little bit more about what your father did with the wines and the family? Uh, first of all, my father had to buy the grapes. So he bought, he signed contracts with all the grape growers to buy the grapes as they mature. And then he had the factory where the machinery was, where they, they liquefy the grapes. And, uh, and they had the curing, they had to cure the wine. Sometimes you cure it for five years, ten years, depending how strong you want it. And then the salad. As a matter of fact, one of my father's customers, uh, sellers that sold grapes to my father was the Prime Minister of Hungary during the later part of the war, Miklos Kalai. And he uh, personally discussed things with my father. He was also renting his estate to a name Eng Engel family near my town, near it has a, Every Shabbos the Prime Minister went to the Engel house for, co for children, had a proportion of children for Mrs. Engel. When he came, he kissed his angle's hand, and he left his hand. This was the Prime Minister of Hungary during the war, the later part of the war, not the beginning of the war. And uh, so my father was well known in the city of Hiratata. Can you tell me how your family celebrated Jewish life? Uh, we, had, uh, we had two congregations, two, two um, communities in my city. One was a conservative, one was orthodox. But the conservative com uh, community was similar to an orthodox community here in, in uh, America. For instance, before Dr. Bela Bernstein, who was a conservative rabbi, white beard, spotted, with a hot color, before he ate the chicken, the shrekhet had to come to his house and show him the challah, the knife, if it's perfect. This was a conservative rabbi. The, the uh, orthodox rabbi was a roof, a Reb Sholem. He called him by his Hebrew name. And uh, they, we get along very well. It's just that in the conservative community, you could be a member even if you were not Shaman Shabbos. In the orthodox community, you could only be a member if you were Shaman Shabbat. Huh? There was a difference in the two communities. The community was relatively wealthy. It was a wealthy community in Yerichasa. A lot of businessmen, all kinds of businesses. And it was a pleasant life. Everybody had their station in life, their station in the community. Everybody was satisfied until, of course, the, the exchange. Um, describe holidays in your ho house. Describe holidays in your house. Um, Describe how your family celebrated holidays in your house. 
Shabbos is a, a Shabbos event in school for the evening. My father came home, same Shalom Aleichem, said, Ribbon Kol Olom Adam Kol Shabbos. What kind of school did you attend? Cheder, in the, in the afternoon, and an elementary school, Jewish elementary school, in the morning. It was all controlled by the state. The state paid the salaries of the Jewish teachers, because each, each uh, congregation, each uh, religion had their own schools, and the state supported these schools until, of course, the middle of the war where they took away the support from the Jewish schools. So you had to pay the tuition yourself. Before 1944, when Hitler came into Hungary, did you hear anything about the war? Yes, I was very diligent in reading the newspaper practically every day. Newspaper that was, uh, was reliable was a major Nemzet. The Hungarian nation, that was the name of the news newspaper. It was neutral, wasn't anti Semitic, it said things the way they were, no, or no baloney. And I was very interested. We read the, the papers every day, and then we also saw the refugees from Poland that settled in our city during the war. They came from Poland. As much as, as many as could to get away from Poland, they came to Hungary because Hungary was a free country. Was there any change in your everyday life before 1944? During the war to before the war? Before the war. No. The only thing is they passed a law in Parliament forbidding Shrita. That was the only thing that uh, the Hungarian Parliament agreed with uh, Hitler. But Hitler didn't ask for anything more that time. Okay, okay the girl, they're going to switch. They divided up their interview questions, so the kids are going to switch now. Okay? Turn the microphone off. Trying to sell that hot apple cider and everything. It's really good. Jesse, why don't you go home and get a towel and tear and put the little jam on the outside? Very nice. And then put this on my tie. Put it onto the side. Mr. Heller, do you want to take a drink? No, I took a drink. Clip it onto the seat. Okay. All right. Oh, no, you don't need to. You did it already. Do you mind going back? You were talking about your father's relationship with the Prime Minister of Hungary. Um, could you describe Shabbos when he would come to your house? At our house, the Engels' house, near the 
put into his estate. And she used to come Shabbos lunchtime to eat a plate of chulin from Mrs. Engel, Madame Engel. And when he came, he greeted uh, Happy Sabbath. He kissed my, uh, Mrs. Engel's hand. And when he left, he kissed Mrs. Engel's hand. He says the Prime Minister Hungary. When the Germans occupied Hungary, he escaped into the Turkish embassy because he figured the Germans would take upon him for the cooperative with Jews. So he resigned and escaped into the Turkish embassy. The embassy couldn't be violated. Even the Germans didn't violate the embassy. All the good things, they never violated an embassy, the Germans. The same thing was true with the Swedish embassy that harbored Jews. They never attacked Sweden. So uh, Kalei, Miklos Kalei, the prime minister, took refuge in the Turkish embassy and stayed there till after the war. Um, and when was your family sent to the ghetto? The Germans sent us Hungary to March 17, 1944. And in about 10 days after they entered, they already separated the Jews that out of the ghetto. They separated the town, as they said, Jews can only live in this section of the town. This happened, this went on until after Pesach. After Pesach, the deportation started. And we had no idea what's going on. We had no idea where we're going, why we're going. But there were three transports going from here to my town. We were in the third transport, the final transport. And uh, this went on until my city of 60,000 people, 6,000 Jews, was unified, was clean of Jews. No, not one Jew was left. This is uh, after the Germans occupied Hungary. Until then, it was entirely different. Um, would you mind going back to what your life was like in the ghetto? Let me start with how, how, how our life was before the ghetto in Hungary. The Jews were generally very prosperous, in, especially in my city. It was next to Debrecen, another big city, and Budapest. And um, my father, my grandfather had five, six children, five sons and one daughter. Three of the sons lived in our town, near the Two of the, one of the sons was in Palestine. And one of the sons was living in a city next to our city, Hungary. And the daughter, my aunt, was lived in Munkac. You ever hear of Munkac? It's a very famous city in eastern Hungary. We had a very nice life. I, I don't remember my grandfather. My grandfather died when I was two years old. The, all the sons in the city came every evening to my grandmother's house to say hello and say goodbye every evening, every evening, no exception. And uh, every Friday, every Shabbos, we stood in line in my grandmother's house and everybody got a little wine, a big glass of wine and one cookie. Couldn't afford one cookie. There was, a, there was this practice on Shabbos, my grandmother. Everybody had to come and say good Shabbos. He got a cookie and a little glass of wine. It was a very nice life. My father was a member of the board, board of the Orthodox Kehillah, and he gave a shear every morning at 5.30, Komoda Tarsus. He gave a shear in the evening, Mishnayas, and Shabbos morning, he gave a shear in Rachaim. This was uh, not a rabbi, my father was a businessman, mm -hmm. but he was a Talmud of the press work, Hassan Soifa, Yeshiva. His speech was half German and half Yiddish. Because in, in the, the Hassan Seifer's area, and my father studied, was all German, German Jews. And this went on very nicely, we had a very nice life. There was no tragedies. Uh, the police protected the Jewish population. And there was no, the only thing is, the Jewish men, young men had to go into the army but not armed. They had separate army. There was only laborers. They had, they had uh, work, work. They were members of the army, but not armed. And uh, my brother had to go to the army 
a day before Pastor Pesach that we were taken away. He was caught. The, the Hungarian army tried to save as many Jews for themselves instead of giving them to the Germans. So every able man got an invitation to join the army Pesach, uh, uh, during the week of Pesach. Pesach well because the next week was only deportation. Everybody went to Germany. So that was a very busy time, Pesach. And my brother went to the army. He didn't equal to take a choice not going, but he went to the army. And he almost made it. By a sheer accident, he didn't make it. But uh, this was the, before the Holocaust, before the camp. As, as I said, it was a very nice, quiet life. Everybody had their, their business or their occupation. Even the Malandum, the teachers, the Feder teachers, had everything they needed. And this went on until, it's a lot of more things that I can talk about, but it takes a length of time. The schools, the Jewish schools are very good. The, the, not the Feder, I mean the elementary schools was on the Jewish uh, Fritz and the horse as I get older. So this went on until the ghetto. The ghetto is separated the Jews and the non Jews, and then the next one was the deportation. I should mention the interesting thing. I should mention that the Polish Jews who escaped Poland and came to our town and many mother towns in Hungary kept on warning us, don't depend on the Germans. Save yourself as much as you can. Do whatever you can, get false papers. The Hungarian Jews didn't believe it. They can't do anything to Hungary is a loyal country. The, the Jewish population in Hungary is on top. The, the, the chairman of the Board of Education in my city was a Jewish lawyer, etc. Nothing can happen to us until it happened. But the Polish people warned us, take refuge. They came with false papers as non-Jews, so they settled as non-Jews. Uh, and then what happened after you were in the ghetto? I mean? What happened after you were in the ghetto? And they deported for the Jews. We didn't know where. We had no idea where we were going. We were the third transport, there were three transports going. Third transport, we were in the third transport, we were putting cattle wagons. It was, uh, we had to walk to the railroad station from in inside the city and uh, board the train the ra uh, on Sunday. We always made it on Sunday so the population shouldn't be working, shouldn't see what they're doing to the Jews. They didn't want the population to see what the Jews do the Jews. You know, and train and left. Every, there were 80 people in each wagon. The, the way the, you released yourself was a hole in the, in the, in the uh, floor of the cattle wagon. And uh, somebody wanted to use it as a toilet. A wife or somebody put a towel around him and he used it as a toilet. With 80 people in the wagon. Every day they put in a big can of water. They opened the car. They put a big, pan, big can of water and that had to suffice as we shared the water, everybody took a drink. After the third day, Tuesday, we arrived in Auschwitz. We didn't know. We had no idea where we were. And we had, had, we had an idea, had he had warning from somebody who was already in Auschwitz and wrote letters, they would have known that there are two ways that we survived Auschwitz. You have to be there when you come. And when you leave, when you came, you had to be able to play the role of a healthy young person. And when you left, you also had to claim that you're a young, healthy person. So they, so they distributed everybody in various camps. But if you were not, if you were sick when you arrived, or you were sick when you wanted to get out, you already got into the train, but you didn't get out. Lost. We went to the gas chamber right away. Plus, the only problem was that my my mother and my little sister, my mother was a young woman. She could go to work. She could go to work, but 
She didn't know what the problem is. My grandmother could have taken the, the child. And the poor Jews that I have working on the train kept on whispering to us, get away the kinder, get away the kinder, give away your children, don't go with children. If you held a, a child with your hand, you went straight to the gas chamber. No questions asked. They didn't want to bother with children. So they didn't want to bother separating children from the mothers. Everybody in the gas chamber. Same as my mother. My mother was a young woman. But my little sister was holding her hand. Within two hours we arrived, my mother was already dead and my sister was dead. They went straight to the gas chamber from the train. And, uh, so what happened? How did I get in? I was a child and I was holding my head. Three of us were in line. Let me get to be back. And we arrived in Auschwitz. First of all, you lined up. They, they were beating you, they were screaming at you. Line up. The woman went on one side, men on the other side. And Dr. Mengele was there with the men, s separating the old, sick ones with the healthy ones. So he was s s standing there, and everybody passed by. And alive, dead, alive, alive, dead, dead. He was choosing. My Two uncles, Mordechai and and Tzvi, and my father, Eliezer, or one after the other. Each one had the same boy, as I, you know, 12, 12 years old boy. And uh, they stepped in line. They, we didn't know that uh, they won't live another couple of hours because they had a child holding their hand. So what happened was that when my father's role came, line came, Dr. Mengele was called away for a couple of seconds. So somebody wanted to ask a question of his SS. And my father didn't know what's going on. He just followed the, the last one that went. He went to the living side. Even though he, even though my father had a boy, a child in his hand, but Mengele wasn't there when he went. He went. He missed Mengele. Mengele was called away for a couple of seconds. And Mengele came back. My two other uncles went already to the dead side because they had children holding their hand. And um, my father saw, this is from people that were there, they have survived. My father saw that my uncle, that, that my, my, my father, when my father saw that my, my uncles went to the dead side, other than the bad side, he wanted to join them. He didn't know this was a dead side or anything side. He wanted to be with his brothers. So one of the Polish Jews saw him going to the dead side, gave a cook, grabbed his lapel, took him back to the living side and threw him out, threw him to the floor. Stupid, it was right don't go there. He is, she said, don't go on that, that side is no good. My father didn't know why, I had no idea. That side was, in two hours they were all dead. And straight to the gas chamber, with children, with the old people, whoever. So that was the experience of arriving in Auschwitz. So I, by mistake, by error, I ended up in the good side, the living side, because my father followed the last one, who was went, a young man, went to the living side. And my father went also to the living side. And when we arrived, in, uh, so we were taken to the showers. And when we arrived in the showers, well, they changed the clothes, they gave us the strap clothes. And uh, they took us to a barrack, they assigned us to a barrack. We were marching the whole city, all the Jews that passed the life test, we were sent to one of the barracks. With me, I was the only child there in the whole group. And we were, we were lined up, just it must have been early one o'clock in the morning. Everybody was standing, some assassin couples came around and looked around the lines. Obviously somebody told them there's a child in the barrack that shouldn't be there. So they finally got to me, and one of the assessments says, if you asked to, how old are you? So I didn't know why, but I always added one, I was 13, said 14, 15, just call my three copies again. They took me to another barrack, there was all, all boys, from 12 to 16. Dr. Mengele did some experiments with infectious diseases with these boys. They didn't know what to do with me, so they threw me into that barrack, and me in that barrack. My father went to went down, he was, he was in the barrack, he was assigned in Auschwitz, and he heard that where I am, I was at the boys' barrack, he came to visit me. And uh, he had a loaf of bread in him. One of the Polish workers there that was working in the in the uh, camp had a saw that my father had a little boy in his hand. He had a 
and said, I said, a big bread in his, in his arm. He gave it to my father, he says, feed your boy. Because the people that were working there had enough food. They emptied the packages of the newcomers. The packages are sometimes full of food. And uh, so the commando that worked there had a lot of food. So my father came with the bread, he found out where I was, and tried to give me the bread. I should, uh, he didn't get any rations two days. He had to wait till the evening the second day to get the rations. I was a newcomer. My father was pushing the bread into my hand. I was pushing my, the bread to my father. So my father, <coughs> my father whispered in my ears, says, Chaim, she did us to leave him. She has to leave. My father already knew that it's a lost cause. He saw what's going on in the camp, marching and eating prisoners. So he says, you have slave, you have to, in German, you have to leave. I took the bread and I had the bread. I, I, I think I took what I offered to one piece of my father. And that's the last time I saw my father. My father went back to his bed and he was shipped to Mauthausen two days later. And he died in Mauthausen. So that was the beginning of the ordeal. I'll take it. Yes. Okay. You want to take a, want to take a drink? Yes. Okay. Maybe a little bit of air for a minute. Do you want to switch? I think, I know that you're probably prepared like that, but I think we'll do a switch. Okay. Okay. Um, How many questions do you have? I have two left. What are you questions? Can be a you. Sure. Whatever you need. Thank you so much. Can I bring you a piece? Oh, thanks. Okay, so we're in kitchen. Uh, yeah, so why don't you guys I'll open this for a little bit of air. I tried to cover a wide area and talk in the fast, maybe. <coughs> it's good. And we'll go back. If the kids have questions afterwards, they'll go back and they'll revisit. I want you to tell them, if you don't mind, about your brother's illegal radio. We'll go back to that when we're. Another, we'll this have thing time fell to off. It. Wait, Donnie, which ones? Just. Okay. Let me do this. Let me do this. Because you said five and six, but like, obviously. What if Donnie gave us two? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I should have said, said what happened to my two sisters and my brother. I'll take it up now. Oh, I. Okay. 
We'll do that. Our two older sisters, my older brother. I'll ask that first. Wait, but didn't we do the question? No, that was in the beginning. So it's like, like when we were in the barrack with those boys who got